So good morning, everyone. Uh, as I was saying, I hope that you enjoy this panel on the Weathering Risk Initiative um, that had some, uh, uh, they already touched upon risk-informed planning, and hopefully uh, you got uh, to hear something that is relevant for your context. Certainly, they already touched upon some of the topics that we will touch upon in this presentation. Uh, we now uh, want to bring your attention to a topic that, as I was saying, is oftentimes overlooked or not discussed sufficiently, let's say, uh, which is the relationship, uh, it, when we talk about the relationship uh, between uh, climate, environment, and peace, which is about nature and its contribution to people. Uh, even though we don't discuss it enough, we did already hear uh, some very interesting points in, in this morning's panel. So we will pick it up from here. Um, so my name is uh, Raquel Munayat. I'm a consultant for um, climate diplomacy and security at Adelphi. And my name is Florian Tietze. I'm a policy advisor for international biodiversity policy at WWF. Even though nature loss and the climate crisis are so deeply interlinked, um, not all environmental impacts, of course, are directly caused by climate change. And I'm very glad that um, the previous panel already touched on this a little bit at the end in the discussion, talking about deforestation, which is one of the major parts, of course, in, in, our, um, in our session as well. Um, and while the connection between climate change and security is often manifesting itself through environmental impacts, um, there are, of course, additional environmental impacts that are caused by humans that are not caused by climate change, but that are very relevant for the security environment and the security discussion. And while many of these factors are already acknowledged and understood and even addressed, um, even at the multilateral level, such as um, United Nations Security Council resolutions in DRC and the Central African Republic, for example, on illegal wildlife trade. However, so far, they've been treated mostly in isolation of one another and not as a structural holistic issue. And some of the interdependencies of those various clusters and pathways that we're going to talk about, they're not acknowledged as a structural issue and we think that might need to change. And this is why WWF teamed up with Adelphi um, to explore these links between the environment and insecurity. And we've done so in a flagship report that we've launched earlier this year. And in this report, we've looked specifically into four pathways, four specific pathways through which environmental degradation um, is linked with security and insecurity and um, how it drives conflicts uh, or makes them more likely to emerge. And we've call, we're calling this the nature security nexus. And, and it's very important to understand And um, since we're, we're discussing climate insecurity here, which is also a nexus, of course, that, that, is it, that this is a holistic issue and it needs to be part of this debate. At the same time, we also looked at it from the other side, how conflict and war are contributing to the loss of biological diversity and the destruction of ecosystems, creating sort of a vicious cycle of um, environmental degradation and insecurity. Our report concludes with tailored recommendations that we mostly address to the multilateral level, to the United Nations system, and as relevant agencies and bodies. However, it's important to say that these really are applicable to all uh, actors and to all um, relevant levels, organizations, governments, civil society, um, because we're gearing them towards specific mandates, areas, and sectors, rather. And the need for assessing the environmental uh, risks to security comes from understanding that we have two parallel crises. So we have on the one side the climatic and environmental crises, and on the other side the security crises with rising conflicts, uh, wars and conflicts, uh, both inter- and intrastate uh, in the most recent years. And these crises are happening in parallel to each other, but they're also coalescing in common contexts, and they are exacerbating each other, therefore deepening our overall crises. And as the climate security discussion advances, rightly so, uh, in the international community, uh, we see that nature and environment are often uh, subsumed under the umbrella of climate change, um, either as a victim, uh, for example, when we think of warming climate as uh, affecting nature and its resources, uh, or also as a means to achieving climate goals uh, by implementing projects in environmental restoration and protection, uh, oftentimes with the, the goal, um, ultimate goal of um, um, 
Um, reducing emissions, which, which is a good goal, of course. But it's also very important for us to acknowledge that the environment interacts with security also on its own, not only in combination with climate change, but also on its own. And it's important for us to understand this because there are very specific entry points for action related to this, um, to this relationship. And the pathway methodology, which we will quickly visualize in this presentation, it helps us understand the complexity of the nature security nexus. Because we often hear about uh, um, an impact on one side and a consequence to security on the other side. But it is only when we look into the intermediate, intermediate factors uh, between um, uh, these two that, uh, or, or in other words, the things that happen from a climate or an environmental impact leading up to an insecurity situation that we understand how these connect. And that's what we call a pathway. And the first pathway um, of the nature security nexus that we've explored um, looks into the relationship um, between biodiversity and ecosystems and livelihood insecurity and instability. Biological diversity and ecosystems of services, so the critical services that nature provides to all human beings, um, is the very basis of the livelihoods of billions of people around the globe. But through unsustainable exploitation of natural resources, through the extensive use of land and seascapes, through pollution, and of course also directly through climate change, these vital natural systems that so many people around the world depend upon are increasingly under threat, are degrading, and they're more and more unable to fulfill these functions that we so desperately need. Food, water, and energy insecurity can often be the result, and I should say, um, should we not be able to bend the curve on nature loss and reverse this, this downwards trend, it will certainly be increasingly the result. And this, in turn, can lead and contribute to political instability, can aggravate political tensions, and um, even overwhelm governments in the worst case. Because as livelihood insecurity further increases, population groups become more vulnerable. And we've been hearing a lot of this uh, in yesterday's sessions and today, um, for being pushed into illegal activities, into criminal activities, for recruitment into armed or even terrorist groups, and the degradation of the environment and the insecurity of livelihoods, of course, is also a push factor for migration, also a topic already very relevant in the climate insecurity debate. And of course, while migration is not a security threat per se, if it happens abruptly, if it's not managed well um, and uncontrolled, then it can lead to increased tensions and even violence and conflict in receiving communities. And in turn, it also adds pressure um, on natural resources and um, public services and job markets in those receiving communities, making the situation even more unstable. In the second pathway, we've looked into how the environment is linked uh, to conflict financing and organized crime. Transnational environmental crime generates up to 280 billion US dollars annually, according to estimates. It constitutes around 38% of the financing for illegal non-state armed groups, including uh, terrorist groups, uh, representing their largest source of income. Environmental crimes, they often form a central part of the political economy of conflicts, and they also, of course, further contribute to environmental degradation and biodiversity loss. Uh, they provide uh, important financial incentives for conflict actors to sustain conflict and instability. And in addition, conflicts that involve natural resources are more likely to reignite after resolution than other types of conflict. Conflict economies, in turn, uh, tend to corrupt and undermine states' institutions, weakening states, and pushing them towards more instability and conflict. So we see there uh, the loophole. There are five areas uh, which are particularly relevant for conflict finance and organized crime. Illegal mining, illegal exploitation and trade of oil, illegal drug production, illegal wildlife trade and poaching, and illegal timber trade. And the third pathway that, that we're discussing, and that's probably our more, most straightforward pathway, 
um, that, that is very obvious is the competition and conflict around natural resources, especially if those natural resources are declining. Um, because biodiversity loss and ecosystem um, degradation, again, of course, amplified through the interconnected impacts of climate change, lead to a decreased availability and access to natural resources, such as water, fisheries, forest ecosystem, and land ecosystems in general, to only name a few. For instance, soil erosion occurs 100 to 1,000 times faster in intensively used land. Forest ecosystems, if they're being degraded, not only decrease the availability of important natural resources such as timber, um, but equally importantly, they lead to severe impacts on water supply through the forest ecosystems not being able to um, fulfill their ecosystem function, the water cycle. And also very relevant, of course, non-renewable resources such as fossil fuels that are particularly noteworthy and that we also heard a lot of already in, in yesterday's sessions. Because our dependency on oil and gas for energy production, for heating, for transport, not only further drives the climate crisis, which in turn is a direct driver of biodiversity loss, it also shapes geopolitical power structures and can be misused as instruments of power and to exert pressure for the destabilizing the um, geopolitical situation. And um, this is, of course, very relevant in our current times. With the decreasing availability of natural resources, the competition over them naturally increases. And that's especially true when it's coupled with other pathways that we've been describing, such as uh, pathway two that Raquel was just talking about. And this, in turn, can quickly escalate into violence, in particular in areas that have experienced conflict in the recent past or where certain population groups or large population groups are directly dependent on those natural resources for their livelihoods. And while most conflicts over natural resources happen at the subnational level or the local level, they can um, and often do escalate into much larger conflicts or contribute to the conflict dynamic in much larger conflicts such as civil wars. And as a last point on this pathway, transboundary natural resources are, of course, also very important because um, a good example are freshwater ecosystems such as rivers and lakes, um, again, water being one of the key dynamics. Um, they, they can increase tensions between states and um, create uh, diplomatic disruptions and, in the worst case, of course, even escalate. And this last pathway is unfortunately um, very current as it deals with the impacts of war and conflict on the environment. Wars and conflicts can lead directly to environmental destruction, as we know. Uh, the areas in and around conflict hotspots are often filled with wreckage from bombed infrastructure and damaged uh, military equipment, uh, oftentimes also chemical pollution and even radioactive waste. So not much needing to be said there. Also, natural resources such as water are increasingly used as weapons during war, uh, in, in the uh, context of war, um, for example, by diverting water or even destroying dams, also another very current example. At the same time, in times of conflict, uh, environmental activities often decrease and the unsustainable exploitation of natural resources and environmental crimes increase. So this last pathway uh, stands on its own because it's talking about the specific way in which war and conflict impacts it, but it also ties back to the, for the, for the, uh, to the other three pathways that we've mentioned. So what's left to say? What's, what can be done about this? Um, first thing, of course, and that's equal to the climate crisis, we need to urgently tackle the root causes of biodiversity loss and ecosystem degradation. And I don't want to miss the chance, um, standing here on stage, to, to mention the 15th conference of the parties of the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, which is going together this year in Montreal uh, in December, um, hoping to successfully agree a new uh, um, agreement, multilateral agreement, um, on biodiversity. And this will, of course, be very critical. Um, and I would urge you all to actively support uh, a successful outcome at that conference. But regarding the impact on peace and security that we've been describing, the recommendations, as I said in the beginning of our report, are primarily geared at the multilateral level, 
but they can be used on all other levels as well by governments and all actors that are committed to address the, uh, the drivers um, of conflict linked with the environment. And this is um, possible by utilizing, as Raquel has described, the pathway concept, by being able to break down the path from an environmental impact to insecurity in a given context. Um, and this is important to say because not only, of course, is every conflict different, every conflict dynamic, every conflict scenario is very different and unique, but also ecosystems and biological diversity, wherever we go into the, in the world, wherever a conflict takes place or a scenario is happening, is very different. So um, there it's especially important to look in between um, into in the intermediary threats, to identify them, to, to um, find out what's working and, and to address them specifically. And this needs to be done always by keeping the larger picture in the focus, because as I said in the beginning, this is a structural issue there. We've been talking about the interdependencies, all these connections, the pathways are reinforcing each other, so we can't lose sight of the, of the big picture and we need to avoid siloed thinking. And that is of course also true with bringing this into the debate of climate insecurity, because there again we have um, a very deep connection. With conflict leading to environmental degradation and environmental degradation further drive, driving conflict, we need to be able to address them simultaneously. And we need this also, and that's a very important point, managing trade-offs, avoiding them if we can, but if we can't, we need to manage them well and we need to prevent as best as we can unintended consequences because these trade-offs, they do of course exist. Um, I've been joining a session yesterday uh, in a breakout group on um, on mining and mineral exploitation, and there we have one of those trade-offs where um, environmental degradation, but also the exploitation of minerals that we so desperately need for the energy transition, um, they can conflict and we need to work together to um, find the best solutions to not play out one crisis uh, with the other because these are twin crises, biodiversity and climate change. And lastly, for this to work, we must ensure that all actors on all levels act in cooperation foster mutual exchange, share best practices, and um, even different areas. We've been seeing yesterday, we had um, participants from the defense sector, from the uh, security sector here as well. Um, we need all actors working together to, to successfully address this problem. And then as, a, as a last point, which uh, I think is most important of all, we need to include affected populations from the start and throughout the process um, to ensure that no program is, is exacerbating local conflict dynamics. So this was a very quick overview of the Nature Security Nexus. If you would like to know more about it, I invite you to download, oops, download the report in the link below. And if you, you can also reach out to us for questions. In the report, you will get a much more detailed uh, explanation to, uh, to for these four pathways, also with examples and case studies that help you visualize uh, what we try to explain in a little bit more abstract level. So there you can see it more concretely and also outlined. So if you'd like uh, to know more about it, feel free to download in the link below that you see in the screen, uh, or also uh, just speak to us directly if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.